to get better at Yu-Gi-Oh! It sounds like a very broad, generic question slash statement, but you would be surprised at how many little things can add up to big things to get you better at the game. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Now that we have a brand new course set out in the game, it's always good to look back on how you can get better. So let's dive on into it and get your balls ready and your ultra bananas. Don't worry, he's still in the closet. We're going to bust him on out for the next video because I'm exhausted. I got to get up at nine in the morning tomorrow. So let's dive on into it, shall we? Destroy the ever-living crap out of that subscribe button as you all continue to do. I see you. Yes, I do. Because we are at 817 subscribers so that we can get to 900 and eventually 1,000 subscribers. Just jazz hands. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to you today about how to get better at Yu-Gi-Oh! And little things that you can do. You know, it's always good, you know, looking back on things that you could have done better. And it's it's also good, you know, every, you know, couple of course sets I feel to, you know, get back into the play testing, you know, grind, you know, that's what I feel like I usually do, especially with new regional seasons, because you wanna make sure that you're up to snuff. You know, you'd be surprised at how one course set, especially something like, you know, Rise of the Duelist 2, AKA Power of the Elements, uh, can really warp the metagame and, you know, take you from where you feel like you're, on top of your game, no pun intended, to realizing, oh crap, I've got a lot to learn in this new format. So one of the big things for me is definitely play testing. Now I know what you're thinking, Avery, that's obvious as hell, but you would be surprised at how many people go into an event, whether it's locals, regionals, YCS, what have you, and they don't play test beforehand. Now this does work for some people. I've heard stories where people have said, hey, I was going to play the Ad Emancipator, and then the night before the regional, I swapped to Eldritch and I topped because of it. You know, I mean, that kind of, in a way, but to a much lesser degree, happened with me. Because if you remember, I was playing Flunderies, and then I went to a regional in Georgia, and I ended up going X3 bubbling out and not getting my invite. And then I ended up swapping to the 60-card Eldritch, basically Floodgate dot deck. And I end up topping. Well, topping, I came in, what was it, 27th place or something like that. So it just it worked out for me. That deck just fared very well. Uh, we might see the same thing happen to me with Sprite. I may end up bubbling out at the regional in Boca Raton on the 10th. If you're going to be there, I will be as well uh, next month on the 10th. Um, I may end up bubbling out and just going X3 with Sprite. I don't know. It really all depends, right? But playtesting, playtesting, playtesting is such a good way to get better at the game, whether it's on EDO Pro, Dueling Book, Dueling Nexus with your friends on Discord. Um, there are just so many great things that you can learn and card interactions and rulings you can learn from playtesting, knowing your cards inside and out, knowing choke points against the other meta decks through playtesting is going to be so helpful to you. Uh, another good way to get good at Yu-Gi-Oh! is, uh, believe it or not, uh, mind games and technical play. Now, mind games, I wouldn't really say, are that big of a thing as much in Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, more along the lines of, you know, acting like you're thinking about a card activation. You know, the opponent activates Sprite Starter in the standby phase, let's say, because they don't want to get drolled. And you kind of sit there for a moment, not stalling, because if you do that, then, you know, you're an ass. Um, but just, you know, for a couple seconds, just shuffling your hand, acting like you're thinking about you want to ash it. And then you say, yeah, that's fine. And then the, you know, the blue comes out and you just, you really kind of show like you're thinking, like make them really have to hold back that load from their hole from falling into their pants in case, you know, they're afraid of getting hand trapped. All that to say, you know, fake your hand traps <laughs> because you would, you would really be surprised at just how mind games can really affect a player. I know it's affected me in the past. Like I think that my opponent's holding an ash or a gamma and I'm trying to play around it when I never had to play around the fucking thing to begin with, like, because they never had it. <laughs> like you would be surprised. Um, and so that can come from a lot of things, especially too, if you're playing a deck that's just off the wall that people aren't expecting. You know, that happened a lot when I was playing that 60 card Elder Lich deck because people knew what my cards did between Elder Lich and Branded, but they didn't know what my deck did, meaning they didn't know my build, which was hilarious. Um, and on top of that too, you know, knowing the choke points with your hand traps, you know, you may know, uh, hey, I need to Ash Blossom the, I don't know, the Sprite Blue. Okay, you may know that, or you may know in general that Ash Blossom hurts the Sprite deck, but do you know where to Ash? 
you know, are you going to use your Ash Blossom on the Sprite Blue or are you going to use it on the Gigantic Sprite? Are you going to use it on the Sprite Starter? Are you going to waste it on the Jet? You know, there's a lot of things like that that you need to keep in mind. Uh, next thing, and this probably kind of goes along with it, and it's know your rulings. Um, this may seem like an obvious one to some people, but you never know when an odd interaction can occur and you never know when an odd ruling may occur. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, did you know, because I just found this out today, uh, Gigantic Sprite, when it activates its effect to detach and exceed material, which if you read the card carefully, it says detach a material basically from any exceed monster. So if you've got two Gigantic Sprites and you activate one and the opponent, I don't know, gets rid of the materials on that, then you can just detach from the other exceed. Keep that in mind. Did you know that when you activate the effect of a gigantic sprite, let's say the opponent ghost ogres your gigantic sprite, you didn't get to detach from the gigantic sprite. But number one, if you have another Xyz, then you can detach from that Xyz because of the wording of gigantic sprite's effect. And number two, even if that happens, and let's say you don't detach, both players for that turn are still locked into level two, rank two, and link two because of the wording on the card. That is how it is ruled currently as of the making of this video. You activate the gigantic sprite and let's say you ogre it, you do not negate it. Both players are still locked into two. So you may be thinking, oh good, I can debir the shit out of them. Nope, you cannot because they activated the gigantic sprites effect. Things like that can, I shit you not, can make or break whether or not you win a game. I have seen it so many times. I have seen it with card interactions where someone thinks that something can resolve off board and it actually doesn't. If you know you use Dark Ruler no more on an opponent's field and then you like, let's say, I don't know, activate Raigeki and the opponent tries to negate it with like a totally awesome that was negated by the Dark Ruler, even though the Toad is no longer on the field, it's not going to resolve off board. Uh, because it was already negated on the field. You know, it's different if, like, the opponent, I don't know, <sighs> tries to impermit and, like, it resolves, like, you tribute or, you know, get it off the field some other way and then it resolves off field because it was never negated. You know what I mean? Um, so things like that can truly make or break whether or not you are going to win a game especially if you're playing something that's more rogue that people may not necessarily know the rulings for and they may think oh his card works a certain way when you know the ruling and it doesn't work that way so knowing your rulings knowing card interactions obviously you don't need to know every single thing in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh, but just the most potent ones you know ultimate slayer interactions sprite interactions hand trap interactions things like that the next thing on the list here may also seem like an obvious one, uh, but maybe not to everybody. And that's, believe it or not, watching YouTube videos, you know, watching uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! discussions, Yu-Gi-Oh! theory, combo videos, especially combo videos if you're playing something like Sprite or Tier Elements, because you want to learn combos with your deck. You want to learn, you know, ways to play around hand traps. You want to learn how you can maximize your uh, five card opening hand. You want to know how you can get the most out of your cards. You know, do you know all the lines of play if you just open up with a swap frog and you're playing Sprite or Dark Beckoning Beast, Deep Sea Diva, what have you? So, watching YouTube, whether it's a discussion video, a market watch, uh, combo videos, deck profiles, getting insights on these players can really help you. You know, I was reading an old article from, it was actually 2011 when Billy Brake was playing against, I forget who he's playing against, but he was playing um, Tengu, like, you know, Tengu plants with synchros and things like that. And uh, he attacked with a Thunder King. And the, uh, the Konami writer of the event coverage had asked him after the fact, Billy, why didn't you summon the Reborn Tengu and attack for extra 1700 points damage? And he said that's because he wanted to play around the Gores. In case his opponent had Gores, he could just attack with the Thunder King if the opponent dropped Gores. He could tribute the Thunder King for Caius and then banish the Gores, and then he still has the strongest monster on the field. So, you know, reading feature matches, watching the feature matches on Konami's YouTube page, watching my videos talking about, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! I think is your best solution. <laughs> but shameless plugs aside, keeping yourself well-informed about the game in general is going to help you overall. I mean, 
I have met a dozen, I shouldn't say a dozen, but I've met dozens, plural, of players who they don't necessarily play all the time, but they keep up with like YouTube and the community and what's going on. And they they still have a good idea of what's going on in the game. You know, they know that Branded's a good deck or they know that there's an FTK with Mortronics, whether it, that's consistent or not is up for debate. Um, but they know what's going on in the game. You know, you don't ever want to go into an event, whether it's locals or YCS or regional, you name it, you don't want to go in with cold feet not knowing what the meta does. If you don't know what Sprite, Tier Elements, Branded, Flunder, Sword Soul, all these decks do, if you don't know what these meta decks do, then you are going to have a bad time. And that should sort of be an indicator for you as a player as well. You know, you can kind of, you know, look at the room or even like a tier list, so to speak, and say, okay, here's Sword Soul, here's Flunder, here's Branded, here's this, here's that. Do I know what these decks do? I know what this, this, and this deck do. I don't know what any of these cards do. I better go and study up. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, these are just a few things that I think are good to keep in mind when getting better at Yu-Gi-Oh! Obviously, playtesting being the biggest thing uh, of all is, you know, building your deck, knowing how you want to build it, looking at deck profiles, and seeing you know, what's the best build and, and just play testing and, and going from there. So guys, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.